Welcome, my friends, to the Depression to Expression podcast. Scott St. Marie here, along with Dr. Sam Vaknin, who is a professor of psychology in Russia, holds two PhDs, one in philosophy, one in physics, and is an expert in narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder. Now, I, I'm so excited to share this episode with everyone. Here's just a preview of what we spoke about because it got heavy, it got deep, and we touched a lot of topics, but all that, all of them really came back to narcissism and how we're living today. We spoke about self-righteousness, glorifying victimhood, self-help gurus and coaches, God, identity politics, and mental illness in the West. It's all in this episode, and I appreciate your attention. I appreciate your mindset of curiosity and willingness to learn. Enjoy the episode, my friends. Sam, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. My pleasure. So, you know, narcissism is is a word that's being used, especially as of late, with with social media. And, and people love to throw that around if people are, let's say, self-loving. But... I, I, is narcissism, can we take this a step further and really talk about what narcissism truly is? If someone is a, a narcissist with a personality disorder, what does this look like? And, and what did this look like in, in your own experience? Well, there's uh, like 26 questions rolled into one. Let's try to <laughs> somehow make, make order out of chaos, um, imitating, imitating God, mind you. So... First of all, we must. it's important to realize that everyone is a narcissist in the sense that everyone has something called healthy narcissism. It's also called primary, uh, um, primary narcissism. This is the kind of narcissism that babies have. Uh, this is the kind of narcissism that allows you as a child to venture out into the world and explore it because it takes some grandiosity to assume that you as a baby can take on the world. So this is the kind of narcissism that underlies a well-regulated, internally regulated sense of self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence. This is the kind of narcissism that allows you to ignore certain challenges and certain threats and, certain, and, and just venture out there and do your thing. This is the kind of narcissism that, that allows you to stand up to bullies and, and, and enemies, etc., etc. So this is healthy narcissism. Everyone has it. Mm -hmm. Every single person on earth has it. Then there is the pathological kind, also known as secondary narcissism. The pathological kind is when there's a confluence of circumstances. The first and most important is trauma, childhood abuse and trauma. When the child is abused and traumatized, it does something to the child's mind. And that something is reversible because the mind is, the brain is neuroplastic. It, it can be reprogrammed and deprogram via, for example, therapy, or even via self-work or self-analysis. So there is hope, but still it does something to the mind. And, and children then are forced, having been subjected to trauma and abuse, they are forced to, to find a solution somehow to avoid the pain and the hurt of being traumatized and abused. And abused. So one solution is to identify with the abuser, and they become codependents. Another solution is to become the abuser, to, to abuse, and then they become narcissists. And another solution is to try to become the abuser and to fail, and then they become borderlines. This is the etiology. This is the, these are the paths, psychodynamic, psycho, psychological development paths that lead to these pathologies. It's very important to emphasize that only a tiny percentage of, the children, of children exposed to abuse and trauma develop these pathologies. The vast majority go on to be relatively healthy adults, albeit with problems, some problems with depression and anxiety and so on. It's also equally important to, enter, to, to explain or to expound on the, on the term abuse, or on, the, on the concept of trauma. Abuse is not only when you beat up your child, is not only when you have incest with your child, is not only when you verbally and psychologically torment and taunt your child or you humiliate your child. These are classic forms of abuse. And actually, they're the minority. There are other forms of abuse which we tend to overlook or reframe or not treat as abuse or even condone. For example, when you spoil your child, when you, when you pamper your child, 
when you idolize your child, when you place your child on a pedestal or the pedestal on your child, when you treat your child as an instrument of gratification, as the tool which will help you, you as a parent, realize your fantasies and wishes, when you parentify your child, when you force your child to act as a parent to you, all these are forms of abuse. So the only thing that's common to all forms of abuse, classic and the f- those that I've just mentioned, the only thing that's common to all of them is that the child is not allowed to separate from the parent. Child is not allowed to separate and to become an individual because the child is not allowed to develop boundaries and to set boundaries, to insist, to enforce them. The parent insists to invade the child, to assimilate the child, to treat the child as an extension, to merge and fuse with the child in a variety of ways, socially acceptable ways like spoiling or pampering or idolizing and socially unacceptable ways like incest. But there's absolutely no psychodynamic difference between incest and idolizing. None. Wow. In both these cases, the child becomes part of the parent, is not allowed to separate from the parent. In the second case of incest, it's physically, bodily. And in the case of pampering or spoiling or idolizing or using the child as instrument of gratification, it's psychologically. But in both cases, the child is not his or her own person. No personality is allowed to develop. So one of the solutions that children choose when they're exposed exposed to these implicit or explicit messages, don't leave me, you are part of me, you will never be your own person. When they're faced with this kind of messaging, one of the solutions is known as pathological narcissism. And what the child does in pathological narcissism, he invents an imaginary friend, an imaginary friend called the false self. And this imaginary friend is everything the child is not. The child is helpless. This imaginary friend is omnipotent. The child cannot predict the behavior of the parents. The parents is unpredictable, capricious, arbitrary. The false self is omniscient, knows everything. The child is is, uh, helpless, cannot cope with the abuse and the trauma, has no effective means and tools of managing the abuse and trauma, let alone eliminating it. The false self is all-powerful. So if you put all these attributes together, you know, perfection, brilliance, omnipotence, omniscience, if you put all these together, you you get the attributes of God. Mm. So the false, false self is a God. What happens to a child who is exposed to trauma and abuse when and if he chooses the narcissistic solution is that the child develops a private religion. He invents a god, and then he worships this god, and then he sacrifices to this god. He makes a human sacrifice. He sacrifices himself, because it's the only human he has access to. So he makes a human sacrifice. It's a recreation of primitive proto-religions. Absolutely. It's like exactly what Jung said. Jung called it the collective unconscious. You know. It's like we are recre- like the child recreates the history of the race, the history of the species, in his attitude, in his attempts to cope. So when the child grows up, there are essentially uh, two serious problems. One, the child, when he becomes an adult, yes, the mm-hmm. child is in a post-traumatic state. Narcissism is a post-traumatic condition. Not in my view, at least. I'm trying to reconceive of it as a post-traumatic condition, not a personality disorder. Interesting. So, okay. Okay. So, so it's a post-traumatic condition. And the second problem, arrested development. The child never becomes an adult, at least not mentally. He gets stuck at some stage of development, usually six years old. It's six to nine. Nine is a very, very well-developed, mentally well-developed narcissist. Most narcissists are four to six years old. And here's the problem, and here's why we keep failing in therapy when we are trying to treat narcissists. We keep failing in therapy because we we relate to narcissists. We try to negotiate with narcissists. We try to talk reason. We try to rationalize. We try. We treat the narcissist that comes into the into the clinic, into the office. We treat the narcissist as an adult, but the narcissist is not an adult. It's a four-year-old. It's a six-year-old. 
And of course, all the th- all adult therapies fail with narcissists right. because they're not adults. That's the first thing. The second thing, we treat narcissism as an all-pervasive problem of the personality, as a multidimensional cancerous process which affects every dimension of personality and every dimension of functioning. Consequently, we trot out, we roll out systemic solutions. We try to cope with the problem systemically. It's a little like uh, treating common cold as though it were cancer. But narcissism is a post-traumatic condition. We do know that trauma affects, does affect all dimensions of functionality, including, for example, interpersonal relationships, and all dimen- all cognitive dimensions, and all emotional dimensions. We know this. But we equally know that trauma is totally reversible, and that it can be cured and healed, totally. Okay, so that can be, I definitely want to unpack that, but this is so extremely interesting. When I think of narcissism, I never thought of a, in the developmental stages. Now, you have this child grown up, let's say, in an abusive environment. Does social isolation and lack of friendships really help develop that that narcissism? Because if you're developing this false self and develop, developing this imaginary and new religion, are these children more isolated than the rest of them and not having this this these social relationships to actually hinder that narcissistic development? Does that even play a role into how this develops? Language itself fails us. Let us analyze your question. Do these children, um, you know, self-isolate or whatever, they can't do anything. They can't have friends. They can't isolate. And for the very simple reason that the minute the false self is invented, they cease to exist. And the narcissist is not a being, not an entity, not an existence. The narcissist is an absence. It's hmm. a void. It's deep space. It's a hall of mirrors. When we discuss, if we discuss interpersonal relationships, we can we can dwell on, on my concept of hall of mirrors. It's a reflection which reflects a reflection. It's a reflexive, recursive process. It's not a human being, not a person, in any sense, by the way. Hmm. Not, um, not, not as far as empathy, not as far, I mean, no dimension of personality we are acquainted with is operative in the narcissistic psychodynamic. So how so, can how can one actually okay, so we can move to let's let's talk about treatment. How can you actually have a sense of self or or self-awareness and and maybe in your experience too, like I'm thinking okay, you're 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 a narcissist and you're behaving in this certain way and someone calls you out for behaving Let's simply selfishly self-interested. Uh, you're abusing this person, both mentally and physically. You can't actually, in treatment or or in a relationship, tell that person you are doing this. Why aren't you aware that you are doing harm to others? Or are you simply aware? And is that even a choice that you, that narcissists are making? Narcissists consist of a single a single operational construct, functioning construct, called the false self, which is divorced from the narcissist. It's a concoction. It's a piece of fiction. It's like a movie. It's a confabulation. It's a, it's a construct. It's not real. So there is the false self. Very similar to God, I think. You know, when you mm. say God. So. And there is the true self, which is ossified and fossilized, dysfunctional, cowering in the corner, crying, four-year-old baby. So utterly irrelevant for our discussion. At this stage of life, you still don't have full-fledged empathy. You don't have any interpersonal skills. You don't have even what we call object relations. You don't perceive others as separate from you. So this four-year-old is not relevant to our conversation. The narcissist, therefore, is a drug addict, and he's focused on obtaining a drug called narcissistic supply, which essentially is attention. Attention could be positive, adulation, admiration, applause, affirmation, or negative. Being feared is equally gratifying. Being hated is equally gratifying. So the narcissist is focused on obtaining narcissistic supply because he uses the supply 
to regulate his internal environment. This is the sacrifice he makes daily to the Moloch, to the god, to the idol of the false self. Uh, and he is addicted to this because it also helps him to regulate his sense of self-worth, his, his internal uh, environment. So this is the sole focus of the narcissist, supply. If harming people will get him supply, he will harm people. But there are many narcissists who are political activists, anti-racists. There are many narcissists who are public intellectuals and propagate systems of thought and living correctly. There are many narcissists who are Indian mystics and Indian gurus. There are many narcissists who are altruists, charitable, and benefactors of humanity. Actually, I would say that the majority of these people are rabid narcissists. They just discovered that pushing a few verbal buttons and virtue signaling gets you places, mm. allow, allows you to obtain supply. Recently, in Canada, by the way, there was a study published a few, I think a few weeks ago, in British Columbia. There was a, a, um, a study published which had demonstrated conclusively that the majority of political activists, including anti-racism activists, and the majority of philanthropists, and the majority of uh, public intellectuals, including the most well-known public intellectual, who purport to tell you how to live life in a meaningful way, and the majority of life coaches, the majority of mystics and gurus, etc., etc., are not only narcissists, but psychopathic narcissists. Wow. Or to put it less, or to put it less gently, con artists. <laughs> yeah. I These think people, that makes perfect sense. I'd love for you to use your beautiful language to to unpack that because I know I think it makes sense from the outside. Like, how could you be no no normal human being could could be in that position of power and convincing the public and individuals of living a certain way and living as a way as the right way to live and the right things to do. I think that makes sense to be somewhat narcissistic, but I guess there's different levels. Consider the hubris and haughtiness it takes to claim that you have found the rules for meaningful life. Hmm. Consider, after 5,000 years of human philosophy, human religion, human studies, human science, consider how hubristic, how insanely prideful and haughty you need to be to make such a claim. Whether it's, whether it's justified or not is an entirely different debate. But just to make the claim, you know, right. consider, consider how, how superior you must feel. The other day I, I saw a video where the most sm slimy and smarmy self-styled Indian mystic challenged the head of a major medical school in the United States, telling him, you don't know medicine, I know medicine. Huh. I mean, and then going on to say that the left breast of the woman excretes different breast, different milk than the right breast in, breast in breastfeeding. It's a different type of milk. Okay. You know, it's the... So you can ask, why do people, why do people listen to these guys? Right. Why do they dignify them and honor them? Because there is something called base rate fallacy. Base rate fallacy is a recent discovery in psychology. We discovered, Dana Rielli and others, we, we discovered that people believe automatically and instantly and without cross-checking and verifying. 95% of all claims made. That's not 9.5, not 9.5%, 95%. When people are exposed to the most inane, bizarre, outlandish, insane sentences, they believe 95 out of 100 of these sentences. And they will not question these sentences, nor will they bother to cross-check or to verify, to, to, to ascertain the veracity of these sentences. So if a guy comes to you and tells you, I love you, I, I am so empathic, there is a whole new movement online of people who self-style empaths. And now they have a rank, a hierarchy. 
there is a regular empath. Then there is a super empath. And now there is a nova empath, super nova empath, you know. Yeah. So they, th- there's infighting, internal infighting between these self-styled narcissists. The overwhelming vast majority of people who would go online and c- claim such virtue are narcissists, out for narcissistic supply. Hmm. There's no such thing as an empath, clinically. It's a nonsensical term, idiotic term. It but may- it aggrandizes. It makes perfect sense, uh, you know, if you just look at the classic American infomercial that's been the same for 50 years. You know, you have these claims, you have these testimonials, and people continue to buy and believe, but it's the same formula, like nothing has changed. The technology for all these products that are sold online and what people are selling is is new, but the formula for getting people to buy is the same, and I guess that can be attributed to people will believe any claim or any most claim. claims any claim you you go online mm-hmm. and you say i i i bring love i t- will teach you empathy because i am a supernova empath i have been a victim i uh, and people will not stop and ask themselves this guy keeps saying the word i every second sentence is this not an indicator of narcissism and by the way, it is. It's called pronoun density. It's a major indicator of narcissism. I have seen lectures by public intellectuals, life coaches, uh, Indian swamis, self-styled swamis from North London, mind you, um, Indian mystics and gurus, some of whom just exited, just were released from jail for murdering other people. And and I have seen these people. And the pronoun density of these people is enormous. Literally mm-hmm. every fifth word is I, me, my, myself, mine, a major prime indicator of narcissism. People don't stop to ask, ask themselves. Someone who publishes a book and the front cover is a giant picture of his face, giant photo of his face, <laughs> and the yeah. back cover and the back cover is another giant photo of his face. <laughs> is this not an indicator that there is something narcissistic? about this alleged activist against narcissistic abuse. Hmm. I coined the phrase narcissistic abuse in 1995, and I coined nine out of every terms and phrases used today to describe narcissism. There is nothing I regret more in my life than than the fact that I have taken my work and made it popular and public in the in the 1990s. Why is nothing that? I regret more. Why is because that? the whole because the whole thing has been hijacked by covert narcissists, psychopaths and narcissists, pretending and masquerading as victims, pretending and masquerading as empaths, pretending and masquerading as life coaches, pretending and masquerading as self-styled experts. Everyone and his dog is an expert on narcissistic abuse. I personally know, attest, witness, and know doctors and professors who know who knew nothing about narcissism declare the next morning that they are experts on narcissism and opening their YouTube channels and garnering enormous following. Wow. And I have and I have written messages from these people telling me that they never heard the term narcissism. But there's a lot of money in it, so they're going to, to enter the field. So I guess if you're if you're educated, let, let's just think of someone else. If you're educated in a subject, uh, a life coach, and you have this personal experience, and you genuinely want to help others, would you not have that that pronoun density I because you're talking about your own experience, and it might sound less forceful if you're speaking from from your own experience rather than saying you should do this, you should do that. You're speaking from your own experience. When I say pronoun density, I'm not referring to autobiographical notes. I'm referring to claims about superior knowledge, privileged information, Hmm. uh, systems of thought, systems of meaningful life, imbuing life with meaning. I'm not referring to, you know, I, I grew up in this city and I did this. I'm referring, I have learned this and this, and I'm telling you that this is the way you should behave. This is what you should do. This is the system I developed. This is, et cetera. Right. And not of not of course not all life coaches and not all uh 
not everyone is a narcissist and so but i would if i have to venture a guess guess and listen i've been in this racket for 25 years i've seen them all coming and going they all almost without exception first made contact with me i have written documents from the vast majority of them describing their struggles and their thought processes and how they reach a conclusion that they're experts on narcissism because there's a lot of money in it mm. and so on and so forth so i have a, i'm i would venture to say that about 80 percent of this population are narcissists psychopaths and con artists 80 not eight unbelievable or is it very believable now since the 90s would you say these rates have gone up with technological use and and online profiles because we we can start with we have the narcissistic abuse of, of, a, of a child but can you develop narcissism through through actions of your own and through technology that we see today no narcissism is a is a childhood uh, childhood reaction to trauma and abuse and therefore is is but what can happen is that narcissism narcissists and psychopaths are like water they look for the nearest ravine the nearest stream bed the nearest bank they they are they are People in search of narcissistic supply in case of narcissists or for sex, money, and power in case of psychopaths. Wherever they find it, they will go. Now, social media and other online platforms are ideal vehicles, um, ideal distribution channels, ideal transmission mechanisms to obtain these goals. So this is they gravitate there. They gravitated there. It's not that their exposure to online technology or platforms rendered them narcissists. It's that they were narcissists to start with, and they are making use of these platforms and technologies to gratify their need for narcissistic supply, or honestly, to make a lot of money. Yeah. Because it's a cottage industry. Uh, victimhood is a cottage industry. It pays. Ask any black person in the United States. It's a cottage industry. I am not denigrating or undermining or challenging the very true claims about racism, about systemic bias, about implicit bias, about institutionally institutional racism. It's all very true in the case of racism, of course. Similarly, it's all very true about narcissistic abuse. I invented the phrase. You're talking to the father, <laughs> the father of the field. I feel very humbled. That's no, a, no, no question of humble, not humble. But I'm it's, saying it's the father amazing. of field chronologically. Mm -hmm. I have I invented the phrase in '95. Everything else you've heard, flying monkeys, I invented. Ghosting, I invented. Hoovering, I invented. Narcissistic supply, I borrowed from a 1937 obscure essay and made it for what it is. False self, I borrowed from Winnicott and again made it what it is today. Somatic narcissist, I invented. Inverted narcissist. Uh, cerebral narcissist, you name it, I invented it. I invented the field. This is, I made this playground. But then bullies, uh, narcissists, psychopaths invaded the field using the base rate fallacy, making claims of empathy and love and support and succor because these are the buttons to push. And they were successful. They hijacked the playground. And that's where you're saying the, the money is made not in selling narcissism, but selling what narcissists are selling now, which is the self-love and coaching, let's say, and all of these things. Yeah, they sell books, they sell DVDs, they sell yeah. coaching sessions, they sell, and they tell you what you want to hear. Mm. Now, people say, so what? This is what I want to hear. It makes me feel good. Right. Well, any, any, any psychology professor, which I'm one, yeah, will tell you that the last thing you need to hear in therapy is what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. That perpetuates perpetuates pathology. The 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 real the only real hope for healing and recovery, moving on in a meaningful way, is to tell you, to insist to tell you what you don't want to hear, to break down defenses such as denial and repression. Of course, to do it in a reasoned way, in a structured way, in a, in a controlled way. But you need to be challenged to grow. And the overwhelming vast majority of these people, and all you need to do, by the way, is don't trust me. Go online. Listen to these videos. The overwhelming vast majority of these videos are 
a formulaic. They're like a formula. And what's the formula? Yes, you're a victim. Yes, you fell victim to a horrible demonic person. Poor you. Um, it's not your fault. You did nothing wrong. You are an empath. So you are superior. You're grandiose. You're an empath. He targeted you because you are such a treasure, you know? Mm. Had you not been a treasure, he would have never targeted. The very fact that you were targeted proves how superior you are. This is catering to the victim's narcissism. Right. The victim's grandiosity. This is aggrandizing vic- the victim and, aggrand- and uh, aggrandizing victimhood. Victimhood is a way of life and a way to make money, mind you. And victimhood is an identity. Here's the problem. It perpetuates victimhood as an integral strand and strain in the identity of the victim. It doesn't allow the victim to move on, not to move on to the next relationship. That's easy. To move on from a stance and a self-identity as a victim. Right. All these all these YouTube channels and YouTube videos, they render a horrible disservice to the victims. Horrible that they will pay for for the rest of their lives because they don't allow them to be anything but a victim because they glorify victimhood, because they aggrandize victimhood, because they render victimhood an identity, identity politics. Right. Coming back to racism. Right. You know? So, and, and you know, unscrupulous, callous, ruthless psychopaths and narcissists they see the potential in this, and they flock in. Millions, hundreds, thousands of them flocked into this. And when I'm saying narcissism or narcissistic abuse, that's one arena. There are many other arenas. I think anti, anti-racism is infested with narcissists and psychopaths. Well, that, that I would love to unpack, because if you had to separate the general population of, of- kind of what's going on now in, in the US, maybe around the world, would you say you have narcissists on one side with this political ideology and this this self-righteousness, and then you have just victims in the other half, and one is trying to convince the other that this is the right way to live, and the victims just are kind of eating that up? Is that what's kind of going on in, in politics right now and what we're seeing in the States? Is it? I know that's very simplified, obviously. Victimhood is a reflection of power as asymmetry. Wherever there is power asymmetry, there will be victims. Even if you take the most righteous, God-fearing, Bible-thumping people, and you let them have power, they will abuse someone. Power and abuse go together. Mm-hmm. Power and victimhood always go together. End of story. Now, should we tackle these power asymmetries? Absolutely. We should level the playing field. We should eliminate uh, institutional discrimination. We should crack down on scum like the policeman who, who placed his knee on, on Floyd's neck. Mm-hmm. We should also crack down on scum like Floyd himself, mind you, who was a low-life criminal career, uh, career criminal. So, but victimhood is not an identity. It is not a state of mind, should not be, let's put it this way, an identity or a state of mind. If it becomes an identity or a state of mind, it's pathological. We actually have diagnostic criteria for perennial perpetual victims, professional victims. For example, we have a diagnosis called dependent personality disorder, which includes strong elements of victimhood. We, we, we realize in, in clinical psychology that anything could become an identity determinant, a determinant of identity, and that victimhood has many, provides many advantages. In other words, we, I, I'm trying my best to avoid uh, professional jargon or professional lingo, but I can't in this case. <laughs> victimhood is self-efficacious. In other, in other words, victimhood victimhood gets you results. Right. It serves it serves the individual. Yes, it gets you favor. It as ascertain. It ensures 
favorable outcomes in your environment. So it's addictive. Like anything that guarantees favorable outcomes, it becomes a habit. Habit, habit, habits combine familiarity with self-efficacy. So victimhood is this. And here's the thing. The overwhelming vast majority of people who are protesting in the streets, overturning sculptures, and I don't know what else, monuments, and I don't know what else they're doing, the overwhelming overwhelming number of these people are well-meaning. Or they're simply angry. And they're not angry at at George Floyd. And they're not angry at George Floyd's death. They couldn't give a damn about George Floyd or his death. They're angry. They're simply, they have diffuse anger because they lost their jobs. They lost the familiar world. They lost access to the neighborhood pub. They are in lockdown. They're under restrictions. They hate the government. They hate Fauci. They hate the medical establishment. They simply hate. They're angry. They're hateful. They're resentful. And this was a perfect opportunity to offload and to vent. And nothing wrong with it. Hmm. Nothing's wrong with it. So the vast majority are regular folks, regular people who are simply very, very angry. And they're very angry at power structures. They're very angry at the elites. You see Bill Gates, and you know they're very angry at politicians. They're very angry at the medical establishments who cannot establish, who fails to provide solutions. They're very angry at academe. They're, they're angry. Generally, they're angry. Yeah. All you have to do is go online and see how angry people are. So yeah. this was a perfect opportunity. Here was the representative, the emblem, the reification of authority, putting his neck on the reification of the victim. Great, great symbol. So everything erupted. What I'm saying is something else. What I'm saying is that narcissists and psychopaths hijack these legitimate emotions, expressions, cognitions, and behaviors. Hijack them. They hijack them. They morph them. They shape shift them. They channel them. And then they abuse them and exploit them. That's all I'm saying. Hmm. There were legitimate grievances in Germany after the First World War. Legitimate grievances, not the least of which was the extortionary reparations by the West. These were legitimate grievances. And there were many movements, for example, the socialists in Germany. They were, you know, protesting in the streets and so on. But then a psychopath came into the picture, a narcissistic psychopath, Adolf Hitler. And he hijacked these legitimate grievances. And he created the Nazi party in Auschwitz. Similarly, there were legitimate grievances in Tsarist Russia. There was hunger. There was a defeat in the war. There were sailors whose salaries were not paid. I mean, there were legitimate grievances. And there were legitimate protests. And the initial revolution in Russia was made by the middle class. And the, the first government, Kerensky's government, was a middle-class government. And then psychopaths and narcissists took over Lenin, rabid dog Lenin, the crazed, insane, paranoid Stalin. They took over, they hijacked these legitimate grievances. The, on, a, on a much smaller scale, we have this in the United States with Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. There are legitimate grievances in the United States of the disenfranchised, disillusioned, disenchanted middle class or working class. These are legitimate grievances. No one took care of them. No one reskilled them. No one prepared them for globalization. No one took care of these people. They were discarded like so much wet clinics. These are legitimate grievances. But then a megalomaniacal, malignant, possibly psychopathic narcissist, Donald Trump, hijack these grievances. That's all I'm saying. I'm not challenging the grievances or even the expression of the grievances, even by violent means. I am very worried that all these movements are hijacked by narcissists and psychopaths. And these narcissists and psychopaths are adept at telling us what we want to hear. Love, empathy, greatness, a restoration tradition, hmm. uh, God. And so they push these buttons. And like the brain dead people that most humanity had become, we follow them. And this goes also 
for the for example for for millennials someone uh, millennials are so lost so uh, confused so disoriented so dislocated their economic prospects are so dim and horrible and so on and so forth that there is a proliferation of coaches public intellectuals wannabe philosophers and so on that guide these lemmings to the cliff provide them with 12 rules for life or awaken the giants within them or tell them that if they only put their minds to it they can achieve anything yeah. of course pay, pay pay 20 dollars for my book yeah <laughs> or you know these are narcissistic psychopathic con artists who are taking hijacking the legitimate anxiety angst and grievances of entire generations and mm. this is the danger because this is a pattern that had repeated itself throughout history if you go back long 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 time ago to ancient greece there was a like, uh, alcibiades you know the the general the athenian general he was among the first to do this psychopaths and narcissists are lurking in the shadows and they know how to manipulate your mind expertly it's their survival at stake it's their narcissistic supply it's money it's power it's sex it's access so th would this mean wow this is so unbelievably <laughs> interesting so if my world's kind of flipped upside down here would a couldn't we just call these people extremely well great salesmen First of all, I wonder if there is a, a, a study out there with people that are really good at sales who also have this uh, this narcissistic quality. Um, but, but what's what's the solution here, Sam? So is it the public becoming more educated and more skeptical and actually knowing the signs of, of what is going on politically and in the streets and how the world is fueled by narcissism and and this this imbalance of power? What's the solution here? What can we do? Because it seems like this has always been the case with with leaders how can you lead a country and not have this narcissistic quality well as usual there are three questions here <laughs> <laughs> you're an expert at this <laughs> it's just a, it's just a challenge one one. okay so so what what i guess what's the solution what, what's the solution so, no it starts with salesmanship salesmanship yes. um there's nothing wrong with salesmanship there's nothing wrong even with manipulative salesmanship there's nothing wrong with marketing, advertising, which are overtly manipulative and, and based on insights from psychology. So there's nothing wrong with any of this. Education, to a large extent, is manipulative because it includes strong elements of socialization and acculturation. In other words, education shapes us to be useful citizens. It, education is not open-ended. Education is restrictive. It constricts our, worlds, our world. It narrows it to legitimate choices and illegitimate choices. Right. So, so even education is a manipulative process. There's nothing wrong with this, with any of this. Where it begins to be wrong is if you are irresponsibly affecting people's lives and minds just to sell. If I sell you a smartphone, at worst, I have taken from you 1,000 Canadian dollars. You will overcome, trust me. But if I screw up with your mind, with your priorities, with the way you see the world, et cetera, et cetera, if I put you in a straitjacket of rules, if I pretend to have access to knowledge and information which is arcane or occult or godly or privileged or and thereby acquiring authority over you and able to affect and channel your behavior in ways which are beneficial to me, it's an entirely different story, entirely different story. And no, the vast majority of leaders are not, not narcissistic. We didn't find, we don't have such a finding. The vast majority of leaders are not narcissistic. Actually, there are quite a few findings which say that narcissistic leaders are not efficient in the long run. We have something called high-functioning narcissists. And narcissists and psychopaths are highly efficient in business. So they are overrepresented in certain professions. They're overrepresented in medicine, in show business, in business proper. 
about 3 to 5% of chief executive officers of Fortune 500 have been uh, formally diagnosed with psychopathy, the psychopaths. Hmm. So in some areas, but not in politics, ironically. In politics, actually, the modest, self-effacing, stable leader who is concerned with the public good is much more successful in the long term than the narcissistic leader who may end up with one term or whatever. So also we should remove this myth from the table. Narcissistic leaders are narcissists first. They happen to be leaders because that's the way they had found to obtain narcissistic supply. Uh, You must understand, narcissists would do anything. If being a racist would guarantee supply, he would become a racist. So narcissists were probably overrepresented in the Ku Klux Klan. You know? Right. If being an anti-racist will garner him supply, he would become a rabid anti-racist, a vocal, vociferous anti-racist. If, I don't know, if um, working for the public good will guarantee narcissistic supply, he will work for the public good. He will do it. He will be charitable. He will be altruistic, ostentatiously. So, mind you, but he will be. So, whatever it takes... Whatever works, narcissists have no allegiances, no affiliations, no real interests. They are not invested in anything. Nothing really interests them. Even a narcissist who is a historian is a historian because that's where he's getting his supply from. If tomorrow, for some oblivious, unpredictable reason, cleaning the streets, sanitary work would become the thing, and would guarantee him supply, he would go and do sanitary work and give up his professorship of history at a prestigious university. That's how fickle, volatile, and core-less, without core, narcissists are. They're reflections, they're shimmering, they're not real. So narcissistic leaders happen to be leaders. They first and foremost are narcissists. Hmm. That's an important thing to, to understand. Yeah. What, can be, what can be done? Well, I think the first thing that needs to be done is to get rid of the question, what can be done? There is this American assumption, American, mind you, assumption, the can-do assumption, that every problem has a solution, that everything is, in principle, could be subject to a recipe, that rules can structure and yield outcomes, that self-efficacy depends in some way on a doctrine and a discipline. These are all American ideas, and they are all wrong. Hmm. First of all, most problems do not have a solution. Most overwhelming vast majority of problems in every field of human endeavor do not have a solution. You don't believe me? Look outside your window. There's a pandemic. Do you have a solution? You don't. Mm -hmm. Majority of human problems do not have a solution. End of story. Number two, there are no rules for a meaningful life. There are no rules for life. There is no meaning. There is no nothing. You just go on living. End of story. And you know what? We are not all equal. And the overwhelming vast majority of the population will end up doing basically nothing with their lives, with the exception, perhaps, of spreading the seed, if they're lucky. Because 61% of all men end up childless. And 40% of women end up childless. It's a fact. Hmm. The first thing we need to do is to accept life as it is, not as we imagine it to be, which is a pathological defense mechanism called fantasy, and not as we can shape it, for the very simple reason we cannot shape it. There is no giant inside you because you're not a giant. The majority of people you will meet, and probably you as well, are zeros. Your intellectual capacity is limited. You will leave no mark in the world. You will pass as ephemeral and meaningless as a dust dust storm. Accept it. Surrender. 
don't fight back. It's a futile waste of resources, and it leads to pathologies like narcissism. And all the coaches and motors and psychology, I mean, they tell you the exact opposite. The law of attraction. <laughs> Just put your mind to it and the universe will gratify you. Mind you, the universe itself will grat- gratify you. Yeah. Yeah? It will gear, gear itself to change the courses of the planets just to gratify a Scott <laughs> or Sam, you know? Yeah, the universe is uh, indifferent, isn't the it? The secret, the secret, the 12 rules, the 16 rules, the two rules. The, I mean, the hell, what the hell? You are born out of, an, out of, a, out of two nobody, nobodies who no one remembers and who left no mark on this earth. You are born out of these two and you are doomed to the same fate. In the meantime, have fun. Try to make the most of what you have, because you have very little. And no, you can't be rich, and you can't be powerful, and you can't be famous, and you can't make your mark, and you can't have any lasting achievements. Statistically, these sentences are, are correct 99.9999999999% of the time. Yes, every generation, there are 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people who have an impact of some kind. Of these, 9,999 are forgotten within the generation, within one generation. And one remains in, the, in memory. How many do you know? How many personalities affected your life directly? Mm-hmm. Three, if I'm generous. Three, trust me. Maybe three, if you are really, really into learning and into into studying and into and you're exposed to the world. I mean, then you then three people affected your life, three personalities affected your life. But if you are the typical human being, the eat to shit machine, <laughs> then then I'm sorry, that's what you are. You are a unit for processing food and producing utterly, utterly worthless product. And if you're very lucky, because again, I repeat, the statistics are against you, you will produce children who will be exactly like you, because social mobility is a myth. Myth. It's a lie told by the rich to the poor to keep them at bay, to keep, to keep social unrest at the minimum. There's no such thing. The, American, the American dream is uh, made up? To start from the bottom and rise? There is no such thing as social mobility. 70 years of studies, or if you want to go back to Emil Durkheim, 100 years of study, have proven it beyond any debate. If you are born to a poor family, you will die poor, and your children will be poor, and your children's children will be poor. End of story. If your parents had high school education, that's what you will have in the vast majority of cases. Or if you go to college, you will not make use of this education because you didn't have the tools given to you when you were a child. We never move beyond our station. The 19th century, with with the various classes, the class society, the caste system in India, they reflect reality far better than the egalitarian bullshit of, of our day. Hmm. And, and all the social arrangements that, ref- that reflect this myth, this collective fantasy, mind you, grandiose fantasy, yes, that everyone is equal to everyone. It's malignant egalitarianism. It's a sick fantasy because it's not founded on reality. Whenever fantasy fails the reality testing, it's pathological. So this g- gave rise to institutions which are highly dysfunctional including democracy. Mm -hmm. It's not working because it's not true. None of it is true. The West, the West is the first experiment in human history to live in a dreamscape, in a dreamscape. All other experiments, there have been numerous experiments in human history with governing systems, governance systems, with organizing principles, with hermeneutic principles, with philosophical systems. I mean, we have been experimenting for at least five, six thousand years with a variety of, you know. The West 
um, liberal democracy is the first experiment ever to, to consist entirely of a dreamscape, to divorce reality entirely. And look where it got us. Look where it got us, because we know in psychology, in clinical psychology, that when fantasy takes over, when fantasy life takes over, this is the extreme apex of pathology. This is when we get really, really worried about the patient. Hmm. Consider, consider, for example, psychosis. Psychotic yeah. disorder, psychotic disorders, paranoia, schizophrenia, is considered the, by far, most extreme form of mental illness. I would say the second one is bipolar disorder. These are the two that really, really terrify us as clinical psychologists because we know our limitations. So what is common to, what, what is psychosis? What is the underlying principle of psychosis? Uh, removal it is a from reality. Oh, sorry. Answer your question. <laughs> is it yes. the removal from yeah reality and the false self? Yes. In a way, in a way, yes. But how do, how does a psychotic remove himself from reality? He confuses internal objects with external objects. He has a voice in his head, so he believes the voice is coming from the wall. He has a vision, so he suddenly sees it in front of him, like you would see a show on television. The psychotic externalizes his internal objects. He projects them in a process called hyperreflection. His personality is so fragmented and so disintegrated, so dis disintegrative that the elements of his personality acquire their own life, acquire a life, and become independent autonomous entities, which interact with the psychotic as though they were outside him, while actually all of them are inside him. This confusion between external and internal, inside and outside, real and imagined, mind and matter, this is psychosis. But I have just described the West. All the principles of the West I have just described. The governance principles, the political principles, the philosophical principles. What are all these messages if you only put your mind to it? This is magical thinking. Hmm. This is sick. It's a sick message. It so. means that if you think, it will happen. It means that if you just put, that your mind has an effect on the world. This is, this is a great way to visualize psychosis. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. If uh, I'm thinking, what, what's the alternative here uh, as far as, let's say, governance? Is the West not the most free country as it claims to be in the world? Uh, like, is it more? I thought it was more free than ancient Egypt, where we had slaves, thousands of slaves, build things and, and absolute power. And is the distribution better now in, in freedom in the West? Have we achieved something Fre over the years, or are we are we still at, at square one? Freedom is not is not an end; it's a means. Freedom to do what? Freedom of it's not an expression. End. Freedom to make money to and, do what you want. And what the test is: what outcomes does it guarantee? This freedom. You would hope happiness. None. None. I just quoted to you statistics. There's no such thing as social mobility. The poor remain poor. So it doesn't get you money. About 87% of global wealth is concentrated in the hands of 10,000 people. 100 people in the United States have more money than all the blacks, all the Hispanics, and 15 million whites. 100 people. That's one zero zero. So it doesn't get you money. It doesn't get you political power because political power, it's a, the West is a plutocracy or Pluto democracy. You know, it's a, the rich rule. So it does get you power. So forget power, forget money. It gets you sex. Well, yes, but slaves had sex. What does it get you, this freedom? The, the, of course, the rich and the elites and the intellectuals at the service of the rich, because every caste, every elite has its subservient uh, intellectuals who legitimize the ideology and doctrine of the elite. 
and who help, who collude with the elite to suppress any right thinking and any unrest among the masses. That's not me. That's Jose Ortega y Gazette. So the, in the West, to keep the masses at bay, to keep them quiet, to keep them pacified, the West made freedom the end. Not what freedom can get you, but freedom. And of course, this is exactly the philosophical debate with China. Mm. Because in China, freedom is not the end. Outcomes are the end. Now, you can say, listen, I prefer to be free with zero efficacy. I prefer to be free. For me, what matters is freedom, and I don't care if freedom means that I will, I'm born poor and will die poor, that I have zero political leverage, that my opinions don't matter as long as I can express them to other people whose opinions don't matter, and um, that I'm going to marry into my caste or into my class uh, to a boring, dreary wife and have two boring, dreary children who will also be poor and have no political leverage and study totally irrelevant information in totally irrelevant institutions who will take my money for that. Mm -hmm. Student loans, student loans went up 610% in the past 15 years. 610%. Students in the United States now owe $1.86 trillion. So even when they give you education, they make sure that you remain a slave. Are you not a slave? Are you bloody kidding me? Can you pay the rent in San Francisco? So your geographical mobility is limited. Mm -hmm. Can you buy a home without paying mortgage for 40 years? Can you do anything? Can you study at a university without paying student loans for an average of 32 years? Is this not slavery by any other name? It's not slavery, but it's less suffering I would say than than slaves thousands of years ago. So yes, we can both have sex, but is maybe the end uh, an end to extreme suffering and pain? Who would that told make you sense? That? No one. Who told you that? I just made it up. The vast majority, <laughs> the vast majority of slaves. There were, of course, outliers. There were cruel masters who tortured and tormented and sexually abused slaves and so on. But that has not been the case that with the vast majority of slaves in the United States. Vast majority of slaves in ancient Greece, vast majority of slaves in Rome, in Egypt, and, and elsewhere. Slavery is a restriction mainly, mainly of political freedom, ability to exert and exercise power. Mainly. All the rest is the same. Working to pay off your mortgage and student loan for the rest of your life is not slavery? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Try not to pay. See where you end up. See if you are not as abused as any slave in the plantation. Try, do me a favor, personal, personal favor. Try to not pay your next credit rate, your <laughs> next mortgage, mortgage payment, or your next student loan rate. Yeah, yeah. See where you end up. And after the experience of spending a month in a county jail, or a prison, you tell me if it's not as abusive as what most slaves had experienced in plantations. So what is the, is there a country, is there a society in the past or present that has this freedom and this way of life for the general public? Is, is someone doing this right? Is there an example that is being set for the rest of the world? Who can we follow? Scott, these are Western questions. You are totally indoctrinated and, and, and poisoned by, by the system within which you grew. Why do you need to follow anyone? Why do you assume that there's a right solution? Why do you assume there's a problem even? Why do you think if there's a problem, there's a solution? These are all Western assumptions. I'm telling you, except that you're a zero, born to zeros, will end your life as a zero. You may have zeros as children who will end their lives as zeros. 
you will achieve nothing of value. You will not make your mark because you have no mark. There's no giant inside you. You can contribute nothing. At most, you're consuming resources. Some people will say wasting resources. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the human condition. And although I, I wouldn't I'm say there's anything wrong with well. that. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say there's anything wrong with that. That no, I think that is the that is the reality and and getting rid of that that state of fantasy, as you said. So mm -hmm. in your in clinical practice, let's say you're dealing with someone uh, who's dealing with depression. Is this mm -hmm. the reality that is helpful with with clients? Depression depression is a direct result of fantasy. Depression is when there is a gap between fantasy and reality. Mm -hmm. When there is no gap, depression is impossible. If I were to accept my zeroness, my nothingness, and by the way, this is not me. This is existentialism. This is Dostoevsky. This is um, Kierkegaard to some extent, although Kierkegaard in introduced God into the equation. This is Nietzsche, of course. If I were to accept my nothingness, my profound, essential nothingness, I would never be depressed. Why would I be depressed? Anything that happens to me would be a great surprise, a wonderful surprise. A good glass of wine, an invitation to, to a podcast, everything. It would be a wonderful surprise because I deserve nothing. And I will accomplish nothing because I am a nothing. And now this insight... This insight is the basic, the foundational insight of 80% of humanity. This is the insight at the basis of Islam. This is the insight at the basis of Indian mysticism. This is the insight at the basis of most Eastern religions. You must understand that the West is exceptional, American exceptionalism, yes? The West is exceptional an aberration, a deviation, a sickness, a pathology that is dying and disappearing, luckily for all of us. The overwhelming majority of people in the world don't live like in the West. They don't think that every problem has a solution. They don't even think there's a problem. They don't have this illusion of freedom for, for to do what? To do nothing. They realize that Western people are slaves. Slaves of a plutocratic elite. They realize how brainwashed Westerners are. I know because I lived in Africa for four years. I worked in Asia for three years, South Korea. I know these regions. I grew up in the Middle East among Arabs. I'm a Jew essentially a Middle Eastern tribe. We don't think like the Westerners. You are sick people. You are sick mothers. You just don't realize it. <laughs> <laughs> you are so inside the pathology that you think the pathology is health. This is the state of health. You don't realize that what you call health is the most extreme, psychotic, fantastic sickness. And narcissists and psychopaths, narcissists and psychopaths realize this. So they are taking advantage of you, of your gullibility, of your base rate fallacy, of your um, strivings, of your inspirations, of your grandiosity, of your narcissism. They take advantage of this. You are sheeple. You are retards. And Nazis and psychopaths are taking advantage of this, pretending to be uh, gurus or cult leaders or Indian mystics or other mystics mm -hmm. or public intellectuals or life coaches. When it comes to mental illness and how the West treats mental illness, and especially psychosis as well. There's different different countries that treat psychosis and see psychosis in also a, almost a spiritual way. It, what the West likes to do is over medicate, as you know, with antidepressants and anti anxiety medications. There's a huge problem with benzos in in the U.S. and even in Canada. 
Is this part of the problem that you see as well as us trying to seek a solution for every type of mental state and pathologize normal human emotion? How do you see mental, I guess the one question is, how do you see mental illness being treated in the US versus the other countries that you live in? First of all, you are very right. The underlying philosophy that every problem has a solution and that essentially everything can and is, can become and is a problem. Because there are two pernicious processes at work. Everything is problemata, problematized. Everything becomes a problem. Everything is cast as a problem. And then, if it's a problem, you need to seek the solution. And then there are solution providers who make a lot of money. So we take conditions that are not problematic in themselves. We problematize them. We, make, we convert them into problems. And that gives rise to cottage, cottage industries or huge industries, like the pharmaceutical industry, that cater to these totally invented problems. Now, I can prove to you that people are inventing problems where there are none. In 1950, the first, 1950 to 1954, the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual was published. Edition one. It was a comprehensive list of all the mental health conditions then known to humanity. It had 100 pages. <laughs> In 2013, the fifth edition, not the 500 edition, the fifth edition of the same book was published. We are talking 63 years later. This time, the manual contained 1,000 pages. Show me any other field where the number of problems went up 10 times. Mm -hmm. So obviously, we are creating problems out of nothing. Out of nothing. Out of, we are, you know, it's whole cloth. It's nothing. Well, um, well where, does, where does narcissism fall in that, in the, in the DSM versus the DSM-5? Was, is that, when was that kind of created um, when was that problem created or could you even say discovered were these, I guess a mental illness isn't really a discovery when you just put a label on it and you put it in a book was narcissism. was there a time of discovery for it? Well, there's a profound, a more profound question. What in 1954, 90% of all mental health conditions were unknown because that's what, that's what it means. Mm hmm. If the book in, in 54 had 100 pages, and then 60 years later, the book had 1,000 pages, it means in 1954, we were not aware of 90% of mental health conditions. Simple. But of course, it's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Narcissism made its first appearance in 1980, in the third edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and then was enlarged in the text revision in 1987, and it took its final form in the text revision of the fourth edition in 2000. And then in the fifth edition, they kept the text, they kept the diagnostic criteria, the nine diagnostic criteria of the fourth edition, but they suggested an alternative. They call it, call it the alter, alternate model, alternate model of narcissism. They suggested an alternative diagnostic text for narcissism, which is much better, much improved much more flexible, much more dimensional, uh, captures the spectrum, not only specific, you know. Because in, diagnosis, in the um, edition four, there was a list, a bullet list with nine criteria. Also pretty idiotic, I'll come to it in a minute. But in the DSM-5, it's a text. It's like a story. It's a narrative. So there's no bullet list. It's like, read the text and then identify the analysis. And I prefer this this approach much more, and also the information in this text is much, much improved, much better than the DSM-4. The problem with the DSM-4, one of the problems with the DSM-4, is that it was what we call polythetic. Let me try to explain the problem. Imagine that you are a narcissist and I'm a narcissist. Not too difficult to imagine, but still. Imagine both of us are narcissists. And we go to a, we go to a clinician, we go to a psychologist. Are you still there? Yeah. Okay. 
you go to a psychologist. I wouldn't I wouldn't blame you if you were to walk away. So go away. <laughs> so we both go to a psychologist. Now we rem- remember there are nine criteria for narcissistic personality disorder, right. and it's enough that you satisfy five. If you satisfy five out of the nine, you're diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. Now imagine imagine that both of us go to the psychologist, to, to a diagnostician, and you you satisfy conditions one through five. One, two, three, four, five. And I satisfy conditions five to nine. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. We are both diagnosed with the same diagnosis, but we have almost nothing in common. Do you see that? Uh, I, I would see that as a problem. Yes, uh, it's a problem. And uh, so problems problem. do have solutions. It's a polycetic problem. So in under the DSM-4, there could be two people diagnosed with the same diagnosis, but have, which have nothing in common clinically. Because you were diagnosed with criteria 1 to 5, and I'm diagnosed with criteria 5 to 9. So we share only criterion 5, but nothing else. Right. I'm radically different to you, because my criteria are different. You're radically different to me, and still we have the same diagnosis. So DSM-4 was very badly constructed. It's called the polythetic problem. DSM-5 is, is better. The text is improved. Well, the text now has so a thousand pages saying that we've we've created these problems. Is it more just is it to do with semantics and people just helping to identify and put a label on something like is it supposed to be just a guide of of diagnosis? Is there is there an issue with that? It's got to do with money. The DSM was created at the behest of the insurance companies. The medical insurance companies and later HMOs and health maintenance organizations and similar, they insisted to codify, to codify mental health disorders so they can reimburse the doctors for the time. So the DSM is an insurance, insurance guide. Mm. And of course, the more behaviors and traits you medicalize, the more behaviors and traits you pathologize, the more money you can claim from insurance companies. So the profession has a huge incentive to medicalize and pathologize day-to-day behaviors, which are common, probably totally healthy. Right. And And that's where I see a massive, massive issue in in mental health in in the West. Um, Sorry, sorry, go on. No, no, no. You're you're making a pertinent point. Go ahead. Well, that's a massive problem and something I'm totally against. I was put on antidepressants and I got Mm -hmm. off this year. I was on them for 12 years. And in hindsight, if I look back, I say, you know, if I saw a different doctor, uh, you, you could have a completely different outcome where well, someone mm-hmm. might say, well, well, Scott, what's going on in your life? I you know there's a lot going on. This emotion of depression, l- let's let it ride for a little longer. Here's some things to think about. Here's some things to do rather than rather than give a prescription. But in the West, people come in with a problem. And, and now I see this now, like you expect a, a solution right away you expect to leave with something tangible something you can take something okay i have a problem this will make me feel better this will make the problem go away this yeah, is, the, this magic is what, bullet. the magic bullet right so how does this work in in other countries uh, is the dsm still is it that in india and people are going in and and given antidepressants as much as the u.s Well, unfortunately, yes. And the reason is laziness, human laziness and so on. It's much easier for a psychiatrist to prescribe pills than to actually sit with you and talk to you Mm -hmm. and and get his hands around your highly specific situation, idiosyncratic situations, and then help you, help you, not help the condition. Uh, Psychiatrists and psychologists treat conditions, no longer treat patients. The, uh, The guy who gave you the pill gave the pill not to you, but to your depression was treating not you, but your depression. Exactly. And that's bad. The thing is, it's antidepressants are an excellent example of the grandiose narcissistic hubris of the profession, because we know nothing about depression. I repeat, we know nothing about depression. End of story. 
here I summarize for you a whole semester. <laughs> That's right. We we do not know anything about the connection between brain biochemicals and depression. I again summarize for you a whole semester. Only 10 years ago, 12 years ago, did we discover that the neurotransmitter serotonin, which is heavily involved in the regulation of mood lability, only 12 years ago, we discovered that 90%, that's 90% of serotonin is not actually produced in the brain, but in the intestines. We have been giving to people, to patients like you, for 40 years, that's four decades, we have been giving you pills which regulated serotonin, serotonin reabsorption, the way you process serotonin in your brain. We've been giving you these pills, not knowing that actually the majority of serotonin is not in the brain. That's how advanced our knowledge was. Yeah. And today, today we are reconceiving of depression as possibly a gastrointestinal problem. I mean, and that is an ex exactly an example of what I'm saying. When there's a confluence of narcissism and psychopathy, when whole professions are taken over by narcissists and psychopaths, because listen, the pharmaceutical companies and the executives at the head of the pharmaceutical companies, they are unscrupulous. They know this, what I just told you. They knew it. They knew it all along. They knew we don't know anything. But they wanted your money. That's psychopathic behavior. It's utterly psychopathic behavior. Psychopaths are goal-oriented, goal-focused. They want your money. They will kill your mother to get your money. They will kill you to get your money. Mm -hmm. They will kill anyone on the way, in their way, to get the money. They are... So, this is an example of institutionalized psychopathy and narcissism. Why narcissism? The grandiosity. We didn't know anything, but we pretended to know. We lied. We lied and we faked. And we feigned knowledge that we did not have. On the one hand, and on the other hand, we sold you, we gave you for 12 years, probably a totally useless product, knowing full well that it is probably useless. And that is psychopathic behavior. Why? Because we wanted your money. Directly, through the insurance company, doesn't matter. A special okay. example. I think that that's great and something that I'm so passionate about, especially if there's one thing I do know a lot about, it is antidepressants and dep the history of depression and anxiety and now gut health. So what was key is is getting off of antidepressants was a few supplements, but also um, getting rid of dairy, gluten, refined sugar and caffeine mm -hmm. and doing that rigorously. Um, but, but this is something that's so interesting and so sad at the same time. So you have, you almost want narcissists at this other level of, of Western medicine where, where we educate people on gut health and away from antidepressants. Like that is the power imbalance that I see. And what happens is when we try to educate the public, Google is really the worst way to do that now because to rank on Google, it's not about how great the work is, how great the study is, and no matter how true the study or information is. It's people who are trained in SEO who can rank on Google when people type, type in how to deal with depression. Of course, it's the person who puts out the most content, the fastest with the most keywords gets ranked. So what you have is, is pharmaceutical companies will rise to the top and people not with the latest and greatest studies. So we're skewing what information people are actually getting in, getting in and needing at the time. That's always been the case, by the way. In academe, forget Google. In academe, uh, the importance, the ranking of articles, academic articles, depends crucially on how many times they are cited by other academic articles. So you have mafias, you have Mafia, mob-like structures, mob-like networks, Cosa Nostra, of academics who cite each other all the time, multiply, in order to game the algorithm, which determines which academic article, which paper, 
would appear first and second and third. It's well known. And it precedes. It preceded Google by like a few decades. So there's a lack of, ooh, is, is fairness even the right word? A lack of, of equal opportunity in the world? It's to, narcissism. It's, Scott, it's so it narcissism. goes back to narcissism. It's narcissism because when you rank things based on popularity, that's the quint- quintessence of narcissism. Narcissus, narcissism is about popularity. How many eyeballs do you have? How do you monetize these eyeballs? How do you rank yourself? How many likes do you get? How many? This is popular, it's popularity contest, relative positioning. It's narcissism. It's only narcissism. So today, if I want to, to find the best conceivable article about a specific topic, I will go, there are, there are uh, no, search engines for academic papers. I will use such a dedicated search engine. But I know the results don't have to do with the quality of the paper, but with how many connections the author has, how many personal friends he has, and how many of them he got to cite his article in their article. Right. Reciprocally, you know. It's all gained. But it's gained. It's gained because of two things, narcissism and psychopathy. It's gamed because you want popularity, so this is a narcissistic behavior, and it's gamed because of money, which is a psychopathic behavior. It's one trying to tell you all the time. Narcissists and psychopaths hijack every bloody thing. Academic publishing, they hijack Google, they hijack social media, they hijack hijack your need to find meaning in your life, they hijack your freedom, they hi- they. They take over, but not in a coordinated way. They are like water. They seep in surreptitiously, stealthily. And you know what? Very often, inadvertently, they just gravitate. They're like inert substances. They gravitate, you know? There's money there. There's money there, so they gravitate there. There's popularity. There's there. There's there's narcissistic supply. I can be admired with this group. So, you know... Um, I followed the career, I made a a personal study, I didn't publish it, but I made a personal kind of personal study. I followed the career of 10 public intellectuals. Um, And I saw how their output is absolutely determined by the amount of adulation and admiration they receive from specific population segments. Hmm. So they start off trying to cater to the needs of a certain population. This population is not responsive, doesn't adulate them, doesn't admire them, is not interested in their work or in them. So they try another population. And that population is responsive. So suddenly, everything they write, everything they say, every interview they give, every lecture and every seminar are geared towards that other population, the second population. Their entire output changes dramatically. Very often, they contradict their earlier work. They make statements they know the, the, the admiring population want to hear. They shapeshift. They morph because they don't exist. They're like smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors. It's a great definition of narcissism. So you're no longer spreading truth. You even believe it's exactly what you want other people to hear. You to gain that narcissistic supply. supply. Aha. Whatever, whatever it takes. Yeah. Whatever it takes. What, what, listen, I, if I were to move to the United States, I would become anti-racist, a prominent anti-racist, race, uh, anti-racist activist. Because it works. Gets me supply. Next thing, climate change. For, against, whatever works. I would move, I don't know where, to a country where racism is the, is the doctrine, is, the, is embedded. I don't know. Apartheid South Africa. I would become a champion of racism. I mean, who cares? Yeah. Whatever gets me attention, adulation, admiration, support, you know? Is... And I don't want to mention names, but I've been following, for example, the work of one of the most prominent public intellectuals, maybe the most prominent. I read his first book, and I read his second book. So You can uh, see the shift. <laughs> so I, I was going to bring that up just as we come to a close. I, and I believe I know who you're talking about. You may have taken a few jabs throughout the podcast. I, I know who you, you're speaking of. And, and what, what issue do you see with, with this intellectual? 
No, I, I, I never, I never kind of target specific individuals because I think, um, I think this intellectual and other intellectuals, they are symptoms. They are symptoms, they are tips of an iceberg. They are representative, they reify social trends and so on. It's not, it's not their fault, if you wish. It's, they are the, the growths, they are the tumors on a very sick body. Hmm. So it's like accusing the tumor for the death of the body. The body is dying, decaying. So, of course, when the body is dying and decaying, all kinds of vermin flourish. It's normal. How can you be a, a public intellectual? As you say, you follow these these 10 people that maybe gain popularity. Is it is it almost inevitable to to be more narcissistic or to to claim yourself as godly when you have millions and millions of people who now know that you exist and that you've helped millions of people around the world? Is that just not inevitable to see yourself and act differently? Yes, it is. It's a, it's called acquired situational narcissism. Mm. And I, I beg to differ with the word helps. Um, you induce change in these people that they self-delusionally believe help them. You drew them further away from reality and more into fantasy land. Fantasy is comforting. Fantasy is fuzzy and wonderful and warm. You feel great in fantasy. And these people are peddling fantasies, peddling delusions, peddling lies that you want to hear, telling you, aggrandizing you, making you feel good. They are drugs. These people, the gurus, the life coaches, the public intellectuals, the wannabe philosophers and the real philosophers, they are, they are drugs. They are the exact equivalent of class one drugs. They get you addicted. And while you consume them, you feel wonderful. And so you want to consume them more. And of course, it makes them feel godlike because it can do anything to you. They have captivated your mind in the worst conceivable sense. They are like body snatchers. It's really bad out there. Hmm. Can a public intellectual be anything else? Well, with all modesty, yes, I am an example. I'm a minor, very minor public intellectual, but I'm still public intellectual. I mean, I, I have 30 million views on my webs on my YouTube channel. That's not a small amount. I would say that's very impressive and, and mm. do a, a, a result of that could result in, I guess, extreme narcissism. Isn't that a source of narcissistic supply for you? How do you, no, how do you kind of control because, that? How do you deal with that? No, no. And you notice, for example, in this conversation, I was true to myself. I did not tell you what you wanted to hear, nor did I tell the listeners what they wanted to hear. On the contrary, I disparaged you. I, I, I insisted that you confront the truth and the reality, of course, as I see them. Yeah. I'm not God. I'm not God. I may be wrong. But it's my reality and it's my truth. And I will not budge or change an iota to gratify you, to satisfy you, to make you my follower, my fan, my adherent. Fuck that. Hmm. I am wedded to reality and to the truth. That is the sacred obligation of a true public intellectual. Prophets in the Bible were the first public intellectuals. And they got stoned and they got killed. They got executed. Jesus was the last of them, yes? Mm -hmm. this, was, this is the obligation of people who have access to the public. To not to lead the public astray. To the best of their ability, these people have an obligation to describe reality and the truth. Never mind how painful it is. Never mind how discordant. Never mind how disagreeable. And never mind how hated they become. And I'm very hated. I'm a global hate figure. I'm a global hate figure because I will always tell you the truth. Even if it makes you depressed and you hate my guts and you want to kill me. And many do. I mean, at least verbally. <laughs> <laughs> well, why, so, why the hate specifically? Is, is there certain content that you've put out or I things say, you've written? Because I say the truth. If I, if I for example, the, uh, the other day I, was, I gave a seminar to a packed auditorium. I gave a seminar to a packed auditorium of self-styled victims. And I told them, what bothers you is that you're interchangeable. You mean nothing to the narcissist. 
you're replaceable. You're commoditized. You're like grains of rice. You're indistinguishable. The narcissist doesn't care at all about you. And don't aggrandize yourself that the narcissist has chosen you. He hasn't chosen you. You were sources of supply. So he used you and like wet clinics, he trashed you. Hmm. They hated me. They started to scream, you are scum. I'm kidding you not. Wow. But, but it is the truth. And I have a sacred obligation to say the truth. If some other public intellectual were on the stage, some other life coach, some other guru, they would have never said what I said. Never in a million years they would have said what I said. They would have said, I'll tell you what they would have said. They would have said, poor victims, abusers are horrible, they're demons, they, are, they should be, you know. They would have gone with the flow. They would have reflected, mirrored the audience to itself. They would have told people what they want to, what they want to hear. That's a crime. That's a thought crime. That's an intellectual crime. These public intellectuals that I'm alluding to and referring to, they are traitors. They are traitors to their conscience. They are traitors to intellect. They are traitors to academia. They are traitors to knowledge and human progress. They have betrayed the people who follow them because they take them further away from the truth and from reality and deeper and deeper into the pathologized recesses of fallacious fantasies. Do you consider there to be just an objective reality or there's only the subjective reality of each individual? No, when I, when I use the word reality, I'm referring to mainly uh, social realities and so on that are easily analyzable with statistical tools and so on and so forth. There is a huge debate. I have a PhD in philosophy among my many others. <laughs> There's a huge debate about reality as, as material, I mean, material reality. Right. And the, the contribution of, of subjective, the subjective component into material reality. And it's a whole different, a whole different uh, story. I'm not referring to any of this. I'm referring to social reality. For example, the fact that if you're born poor, most likely you will die poor. Mm-hmm. Not only that, not only that, but in the last 20 years, most likely you will die poorer than your parents. That's a fact. End of story. Why lie to the people? Yeah. Why, tell them, why tell them, yes, you can be rich. You, can, you cannot be rich. You cannot be rich. Actually, you will end your life poorer than your parents. Why? Because less than one in a million, according to statistics, ends up life with 10 times the wealth of his parents. Uh, Can you be this one in a million? Of course you can. But this is not what the life coaches are saying. The coaches are not saying, listen, one in a million of you will succeed. They tell you all of you will succeed. Just follow what I'm Follow my advice, follow my rules, and then all of you will become rich. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, and I I noticed the change within myself when I started reading. First of all, the happiest people, the most content people aren't in the self-help book aisle, right? But I started reading those and I felt that I was getting actually less content and feeling worse reading self-help books. And I read them for years as to look for you know, the ultimate solution for depression, a new way to think about things. And kind of when you stop, you actually feel better when you remove yourself from other people's, I wouldn't say orders, but expectations of what life should be like and what your life should be. The self-help industry is is definitely one that could be called, you know, sick and, and, and it, taking advantage of people. I agree with you on that. It's aptly named. It's self-help. It helps the author. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's, it's so true. So I just want to just not challenge you, but ask you since you, you've, you've studied you philosophy, a PhD in philosophy. So we talk about the, this, this constant culture of seeking solutions, but is that not what philosophy has been doing since ancient Greece is the ultimate question of, Who am I? The existence of us? Why are we here? These are awesome questions that that tickle the mind and I absolutely love. Is that not just a question to finally seek a a solution or are there certain questions that are just not worth asking? 
No, philosophy is not about answers. Ah. And definite, definitely not about solutions. Philosophy is about formulating the right questions. That's what all the major philosophers have been doing since uh, Plato and Aristoteles. Socrates, of course. Socrates, the Socratic method is about questions, questioning. So um, philosophy is about this. What has happened in the starting in the 17th century philosophy started to bifurcate or to actually fragment. And you started to have branches of philosophy which were concerned with solutions. So, for example, one branch of philosophy later became physics. But initially it was known as philosophy of nature. And then when it became clear that uh, philosophy of nature dealt with solutions, not with questions, Philosophy as a discipline, divorced. To this very day, most countries of the world, there's no separate faculty of psychology in the university. It's, it's a branch of the faculty. It's part of the department in the faculty of philosophy. Psychology used to be a part of philosophy. But when psychology at the beginning of the 20th century started to, or the end of the 19th century, started to be interested in solutions, it's separated from philosophy. Any time, any time philosophers started to be interested in solu solutions, they ceased to be philosophers. They became physicists, they became mathematicians, they became psychologists, they acquired a different identity. So philosophy deals with posing the right questions. And posing the right questions so that maybe other branches of knowledge will attempt to find uh, answers. Not solutions, by the way, answers. Why not solutions? Because the answers are always wrong. The basic, the, the fundamental, the most profound assumptions of science is that it, it approximates reality, it approximates truth. Science can never attain it. It's what we call asymptotic. It can never attain truth. Right. All the answers in science, all the answers in science, all the theories in science, all the everything we think we know, we know one thing for sure is not true. The only thing we know for sure is that whatever we know today is not true. <laughs> and that is that huh. is the essence of science. Uh, is it is it fair? Have I judged you correctly to say that you're an atheist? No. Atheism, atheism is a form of religion. It's anything that involves belief is a religion or an ideology, which is a distortion of religion, secular religion. So with your so view on, atheism, on fantasy and, and the staying in reality with what it presents us, do you believe in a, in a higher power in, or in a God? Is, is being Jewish as well? Is there you have an affinity for that beautiful Old Testament? I do my best to avoid terms that can never be defined, mm -hmm. never mind how, mu how much you try. So I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know what is higher power, as I have no idea what it means life energy. Or soul, or, you know, so I try not to waste my time on terms that cannot be defined. Because I believe that in the absence of mutually agreed terminology, no reason, reasonable or rational discourse is possible. You know what? No discourse is possible. Not even mystical discourse. I mean, you need to agree on a language. Communication is critical if you don't want to devolve into solipsism, if you don't want to, you know, cut yourself out of the world. So I have no idea what is God. I doubt very much if anyone does, never mind how, how many people will protest. And I have no idea what is a higher power. Hmm. So I, I therefore cannot relate to your question because it contains words which are meaningless. Do you follow the, the guidelines of, of Judaism? Is that fair to ask? The guidelines of Judaism, yeah. In, in which in which areas? Um, I guess the the Sabbath. Why Not would having... I follow? Why would I follow anyone's guidelines? The the or ten, anything's com guidelines. the ten commandments. Ten commandments are a reasonable distillation of civilized civilized coexistence. They're useful, in other words. Right, but this is something uh, that that you don't take. I'm not going to say takes it, but you don't put a lot of thought into. It's it's not really important. 
since it's hard to define and there's not uh, overwhelming evidence for what's out there. You mean God? Yeah. Well, I didn't put lately a lot of thought into the tooth fairy <laughs> as well. So, no, it's a nonsensical term. Not in the sense that it's nonsense, but nonsense. It has no sense. It's a nonsensical. It's an empty, we call it in mathematics, an empty set. It's a, it's a combination of letters that convey nothing. Hmm. So in the mind of a, a narcissist, since they're creating, as you said, like almost creating this false self and this God figure, is it more mm -hmm. likely for, or is, is there also religious affiliation that they, that they live with? Do they believe in God or they just believe in, in themselves now? I think you should differentiate between God as an objective entity, which is meaningless because no one can define what is God. So the, the whole question is meaningless. And God is a piece of fiction that affects people's lives. God has an existence, of course. God has, has affected people's lives and people death, people's deaths uh, throughout millennia. People died for God. People went to the cross for God. People talk about God. People like you and me, for example. So God has an existence as a very, very riveting and, and, and stimulating and motivating piece of fiction. So if you're asking whether the narcissist believes in this piece of fiction, which is called God? No, because he has his own, he has his own God. And if he pretends to believe in God, it's in order to manipulate people. So he will say that he believes in God because it gives him access to parishioners that he can abuse or to, or it makes him a holy man. And then he can fuck many young girls or he, you know, so in that ways, the narcissist will make use of God as he will make use of anti-racism, as he will make use of racism, as he will make use of weapons, as he will make use of anti-weapons. I mean, he will make use of anything, whatever works. I mean, if God works, why not? Good I, for God. I, yeah, I, I guess I'm still stuck, if, if I could rewind of, of what we chatted about, I'm still stuck on, on treatment for, like, I, I understand and I'm totally opposed to giving people pills and knowing that there's other solutions or other ways to think about um, depression, anxiety, and different types of mental illness. When it comes to narcissism, we, you said we, we look for a solution, but there, there's no solution. So when, when someone who meets those guidelines of the DSM-5 and they, they go into a, a session with a therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever it may be, what happens in that session? Can you be, quote unquote, cured of narcissistic personality disorder? No, there's no, there's no cure and so on. I, I came up with a new type of treatment that ameliorates some aspects and eliminates other aspects of narcissism. But narcissism cannot be cured because um, it's, uh, as I said, it's, uh, the narcissist is stuck at a certain mental age and there is no way to to reverse this. There's no way to make him an adult. And it's not only a child, but a traumatized child. So it's a very, very def deficient and, and problematic and and destroyed child. It's a damaged, damaged goods, broken. And so we can't put we can't put Humpty Dumpty back together. What we can do in with some treatment modalities, we can modify behaviors. It's, uh, with medication, we can reduce symptoms like perhaps obsessive compulsive disorder or behaviors. With my kind of treatment, I, I, call it, I dubbed it called therapy. Uh, I can eliminate the false self and grandiosity. But this is not the narcissism. Narcissism is a, a traumatized child. And this child is stuck and will never grow up. There's no way to convert a child into an adult when the adult is 60 years old. Yeah? Right. But you treat the, the child in these sessions. That's the only yes. way to have effective treatment. Yes. I, a cold therapy is, is a combination of techniques uh, borrowed from trauma therapies and from child psychology. The cold therapy doesn't include a single technique from adult psychology. It's actually child psychology adapted for traumatized children. 
And we, with that, we have a lot of experience. And with that, we are very successful, actually. We treat traumatized children, children after sexual abuse, after, or children who have survived a natural disaster, or children in famine, with famine. We, we have, we're very successful at, at treating traumatized children. So um, I borrowed these techniques, put them together, added a few 25 techniques that I invented, and put all this package together, and I'm treating narcissists as traumatized children. I'm taking away the edge of the trauma, and I'm teaching them that grandiosity and the false self are no longer necessary. Um, the minute they're not necessary, there's a principle called economy, economy of the mind, mental economy, when something is not necessary, it dies automatically. When I show these children that they can cope without grandiosity and false self, grandiosity and false self die automatically. But grandiosity and false self are only elements in narcissism. Narcissism is a, is a state of being. Um, and so th there's, there is no way to take the narcissist and make him something else. It's, a, it's not like sex change. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. That is unbelievably interesting, and I think I could ask you probably another hundred questions, and we could uh, speak all day. But I would love to have you on for for a second podcast. My, my I, life, my life expectancy is limited. I'm 59 <laughs> years old, so we may have to take this into account. I hope I look as good as you do at age 59, Sam. Um, well, every, everyone, please check out Sam's YouTube channel. All the links are in the description below. Uh, Maligan Self Love, there was an updated version I saw on Amazon. Yeah, the 10th edition was published, uh, but it was published in 2015, five years ago. And it's the 10th edition. And are there things that you would, you know, it's, it's a few years old now. Oh, are there I, things that are you could add already years later? Oh, I publish, I publish updates in the form of separate books. So if you go to Amazon, my Amazon store, you will see all the... All the recent books and i've just published a narcissism reader in collaboration with another psychologist so amazing you you can find all this on amazon just type sam vaknin and then ignore the results yeah <laughs> he's ranking on google everyone he's gotten all these academic readers to cite him that's why you're ranking yeah. um yeah. everyone the links are in the description for for sam's uh amazon store his youtube channel um any, anything else you want to to tell the audience before we before we turn off here Oh, the mic is yours. Up. Anything at all. Give it up. Your strength, the proof of your strength and your resilience and your only hope for contentment, because happiness is too much to ask, but contentment is if you stop fighting. It is the fight that drives you to pathologies. The fight pathologizes you. Everyone is encouraging you to fight. Everything, everyone is encouraging you to change. Everyone tells you that if you don't change and you don't succeed, and you don't fight, it's only your fault. Give it up. Forget all this. Forget what you can do with life. Just live life. Just be. <laughs> End of story. Being is a huge accomplishment. Just existing is a huge accomplishment. And stop catering to your grandiosity. Stop believing that you can have an impact or that there are solutions or, or even that there are problems. There is so much to do, you know, in a typical day. Just get up and do it. Don't think. Don't overthink. Don't overanalyze. Don't develop this delusion that you are in control, that you can make a change, that things can get better or worse or anything. It's beyond you. You are insignificant. Your life is meaningless. It's all nothingness. Get on with it. That's my message. <laughs>